Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for coming for this occasion. Um, it's uh, like the old matinees, a two-for-one kind of thing. It's a lecture plus the opening of the show. Um, I, I, have to, I have to confess that um, it's, it's not easy to introduce. It's not an easy task to introduce Sylvia, Sylvia Levin, for, for many reasons. Uh, First of all, because his intelligence and thoroughness and all that, but also my, my personal friendship with her. So it's always much more tricky to introduce people that you have a close relation. Um, but there was a couple of things that uh, occur, and, and I will say that probably three or four random thoughts, they are not really connecting with each other. But there were things that it was triggering, and particularly on the occasion of, of the show in the gallery, which you guys will have the chance to see later on, and it's, a, it's an extraordinary show. And we're very, very happy and proud that the show is here. Um, but a couple of things I was thinking is that, that architecture is really a very complex. It's a very complex discipline. It's a very complex field. Uh, and there is a reason why, um, at the end of the day, there's always a fairly small group of architects that history choose to remember at any given time in terms of relevance and so on. And uh, now, if you start to think about uh, theories, historian, critics, it's even a shorter list at any given time, and so on, which I'm not so sure that makes that it's more difficult architecture or, or by proportion, but there is something interesting about this problem, how each and each given time these things operate. Um, again, it's always great to have Sylvia here, and she is a frequent um, visitor and, and, and friends of the school, and always his appearances are relevant, welcome, and memorable. Um, but I did something that I usually don't do, which is to, to, I was looking through a series of quotes, more specific, not just to introduce Sylvia in the context of the lecture, but also in the context of the show, which I think is a more specific thing, which is different than introduce somebody with a work at large. This is a tricky one because she's going to talk now, but also part of her work is there, I suppose. So it's kind of a, an architect giving you a lecture and then take you to the building right after. So there is something really unique about that. So I, I, I was really thinking this notion about what constitutes history, theory, and criticism, and how much is uh, a documentary, how much is a fiction. So there is always, a, of course, the very famous quote of Mark Twain, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Um, but one of the things I, I want to say that to me I think is crucial, and it's crucial about the show, but I will say it's crucial at least in my own read of Sylvia's work, which is, I think really true relevant theoretical work, even if it's contemporary or historical or any form of shape, I think it has the mission to produce hesitation. It has to make you hesitate about things that you think you know or things that you take as a given. And in my particular case, um, what, what I, I find interesting is I was educated in a context and a period of time that <laughs> I was educated to distrust and really hate postmodernism. And I was very committed to that idea uh, until I start to read later on things that Sylvia and other remarkable theorists and thinkers did, and give me the and start to hesitate about my own take and my own readings about this. And I think you can apply that to any particular things that you think you know, and then very smart people make you see it in a different way. And I think that, honestly, I will say, is one of the most important mission of a theorist or a thinker or a critic or historia, however you want to define um, somebody like Sylvia Levin. Um, and I think this show does, does that. It, it will give you that sense of hesitation. It will make you hesitate about what you think you know about the work of fairly remarkable and, no, and very well-known figures in our field and how this can be rethought again and again and make you to rethink again and again. So. Um, Somebody once says, and I think this is not really that important, but that every architect really is a theorist because actually you don't do building. You think about something and somebody else builds it. For the same token, I would argue that every, theor every um, theoretician or historian or critic is by default an architect. The other thing which I thought it was an interesting, and this is more like a footnote, I was going through some of your books, Sylvia, and I realized that uh, there is an immediacy of change in the way that, 
the relation with architecture. So it starts in form follow libido. It seems like a longer thing. Then we move to kissing, which it seems shorter. And just now it's just a flash. Um, so <laughs> whatever that means, I don't know. But there was something really interesting about the titles of these books. And I think also it, turns, I think it, take, it talks about a little bit the demands of what the time frame for things to rethink about it. Um, so again, th this is, again, it's not here or near, neither here or there. But I thought it was an interesting one. But ultimately, what I will say is Silvia is one of the very few uh, on, on, on this field that he has a project with capital P. I think his, her work is always relevant. It's always generous, but at the same time challenging and very, very, he uh, has a capacity to define moments and context in a way that very, very few people can do that. So there was something also that uh, the, the show trigger in my head was this, this idea that Borges always talk about that the original is unfaithful to the translation. And to me, that always has been one of the most interesting things about whatever postmodernism contribute, contribution was. I think maybe something is at the heart of this. Uh, and the last one, which I think is my, probably the one, my favorite one, and I think is the most interesting one, and I'm, I, I will not argue that uh, Sylvia spoke openly or very straightforward about this, but I, I always read it as a subtext or in between line of many of the things, which is um, this idea that, first of all, the notion of a style should not be considered a bad thing, and this is something that academia worked very hard to try to make it like a bad thing, or actually, I think it's not. Um, but this Martin Amis quote that I always found very interesting, which is the idea that style is not neutral, it gives moral directions. And I think this is at the heart of the problem, and I think we are confronted as architects. And I think to have somebody like Sylvia always to put the light or a, or a magnifying glass on certain particular pieces of architecture is not that it makes us or forces us to be more truthful to ourselves, but at least, once again, I think it makes us to hesitate. And I think at the end of the day, I think hesitation is absolutely crucial if you want to produce any kind of a cultural apparatus to operate as an architect or as a thinker or anybody who had to contribute to any field in any form or shape. So, without further ado, it's my, it's my pleasure and happiness to welcome Sylvian Levin once again to SciArc. Really, there, there is no place like uh, SciArc. Um, there's never been a place like SciArc, and one of the greatest things about it is that you can just call them up and say, I have a crazy idea and I'd like to do it, and they just say yes and they don't ask any questions. Um, uh, they're really, uh, the, the, the school has a generosity to the field in that regard that I think is really important. It's important beyond the people uh, that are here. It's important uh, to all of us. Um, and in this particular case, I'm, uh, I, I note it especially because I was pretty sure that Hernan was going to hate everything in the show. Um, and the fact that he uh, doesn't you know, was a kind of good sport about using his school to show something that he's not much interested in, I think is, uh, makes him a true director. So I really appreciate that. Um, there's an incredible number of people who worked on this um, exhibition, a number of institutions, um, too many to mention by name here, except read all the names, read them very carefully, because um, they're all there. And um, I'd like to, I uh, really give special thanks to Sarah Hearn, my associate curator, um, who's just uh, an amazing person, um, a brilliant scholar, a fantastic curator, and a wonderful friend. And I love working with you, and I hope we get to do it uh, many more times. And Aaron and Ian, like so beyond the call of duty, beyond exhibition design, collaborators, also co-curators. Um, Aaron's mom is here, which I think is just so cool. Um, and anyway, thank you. Uh, none of it could have happened uh, without you. And, and Matthew, I don't know you very well yet, but really you just pulled out uh, all, the, all the stops. So in the UCLA students and the SciArc students, it's just, uh, um, I never thought so many people could uh, care so much about little uh, bits and pieces of trash. So um, I'm very grateful. Um, okay. Uh, architecture entered the space of the museum as a display of fragments. 
that architecture be in discontinuous bits and pieces, whether produced by vandalism or by collecting, was a necessary precondition to this entry, to its shift from a place in the world to a place in a world made of representations. Fragmentation abstracted architecture into a system of signs, signs that be, could be reconstituted as a history of modern France, uh, you know, in this case, or as a display of creative genius that sewn himself. But it was not only the interchangeability of these parts that was necessary to turn them into signs. It was the way in which the fragment, with its irregular edges, its backsides, its need for ugly, shitty little pieces of metal to hold them up, uh, performs their material life that dramatize the magic, if you will, of this transubstantiation of matter into signification. The museum then started as a locus of architectural melodrama, fostering a dramaturgy of exaggeration, where intense quantities of design distract attention from the artifice needed to make the production of architecture as a signifying structure appear both natural but also difficult, the result of effort, the result of design. The melodrama of the fiction between what uh, in that era would have been called the signifier and the signified, made not only these specific exhibitions of uh, importance to postmodernism, these two exhibitions were written very elaborately about by the major postmodern historians and theorists, but made the exhibitions themselves an especially important site for postmodern practice. These exhibitions did not represent buildings, but instead staged architecture's transformation into a sign. Buildings themselves aspired to the status of exhibition, offering themselves up not just as signs, but as demonstrative performances of the fact that they were signs. Architectural elements from archives and pediments to bricks were staged as fragments, deforming their use value into symbols, which is to say, in the parlance of the era, buildings as signs inadvertently turned out to be ducks. I'm really interested in this inadvertency and in the effort to use this inadvertency to write a new history of postmodernism which is to say, I'd like to use fragments and the capacity of the fragment to make us look carefully beyond the signifying system that they thought they entered the world within to produce attention elsewhere. Signs, fragments are defamiliarizing. They, if you look at them directly, if you use, let's say, your art historical skills, to do a close reading of the fragment, you can't easily pull back out and find the thing that it thought it belonged to. So if we use that fragment, this one here, which is in the gallery, we can use it instead to trace an alternative kind of architectural activity, to look not at it as a magical transubstantiation, but actually as a sign that was produced by things like doing research into signs. Um, signs that were part of urban communication uh, systems, like the use of print technologies to make signs. So one of the early Venturi projects uses Photostat and various things like this, not only to produce the sign in the world, but to produce the sign on the paper. The introduction into architectural activity of research if you look in the Venturi archive, you see as many notepads, like you see on the bottom here, of the list of things that he was going to look at in the library. There are more of his notes about library research than there are traditional forms of drawing. So these fragments that alienate the sign from its signification um, instead put architecture or reveal architecture in this period to have belonged to a very complex communication network. So I just want to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, think about these signs uh, for a moment and to think about 
Uh, for example, in the case of this fragment, if we look through the fragment, we see not only the decoration discourse that was produced by the architects themselves, but the ways in which the production of architecture entered a complex media system of print and photographic reproduction um, that altered how architects communicated, shifted the site of architectural production from the building site to the communications environment, and entangled architects in communication systems that were not local to architects and did not have to do with traditional architectural skills of expertise and drawing and talent, but placed them within ubiquitous systems through which architecture had to navigate like everybody else. So the story of this building begins, in other words, not with the traditional sketch, uh, but maybe with this ad in the Village Voice of 1966, in which Andy Warhol was um, advertising his willingness to trade anything for art. And so the story goes that a guy named Sidney Lewis was driving around in a cab in New York reading the Village Voice and came across this sign and called him up and said, OK, what would you like? And um, he sent him uh, a catalog. Sidney Lewis was the owner of this company who had made these catalogs. Um, and Warhol said uh, what he wanted was a really big, giant television, the biggest television um, that you could buy through the catalog. And uh, what this guy got instead uh, uh, in exchange was art, uh, pictures of himself and pictures of his wife. And so began a very elaborate art collection, uh, trading, uh, trading uh, through this advertisement. Um, and these are signature images that you know repeated images, Polaroid images that would produce a pattern with changes in color, enabling uh, Francis Lewis to be many different Francis Lewises through the use of color. Um, this idea of how you would go shopping in a catalog and produce things mechanically, this is of course also the period that Warhol is uh, doing his paint by numbers series uh, using uh, painting kits that you uh, buy in a catalog. So there was a very complex, let's say, media exchange through a, the, the, the channels of uh, consumer uh, culture um, that led to wallpaper, you know, the, the kind of thing that you could buy in the best products catalog uh, for your uh, home. So um, it really shouldn't come as any surprise uh, um, that when uh, Venturi entered the scene of Best, that the Warhol channel of factory production and images circulating through media and print technologies and wallpaper was already uh, there. So it really isn't surprising that in one of the first letters to his new client, he includes, in, includes a piece of wallpaper um, that he wants to use as the scheme uh, for his design. Uh, like wallpaper like this, wallpaper that he happened to have in his house in Philadelphia. And he imagined that he would ultimately, like Warhol, do many of these buildings, and they would all have the same poppy, and they would just be different colors, just like Warhol made portraits of people with different colors to differentiate one from the other. Um, and of course, it should also go without saying that the Lewis's collected art, and so then they collected architects, and they made lots of different architectural projects um, that, of course, ended up in a catalog. Now, architecture and catalog shopping, and you know, it has a long history beyond the scope of this lecture. But I just want to point out one story. You know, Corb bought his Tony chairs in catalogs. Um, but he also produced wallpaper that you bought through a catalog. So when Salubra approached um, uh, uh, Corb, um, they went to his paintings, and he selected which colors he wanted from his paintings, and they matched the wallpaper to his paintings. And then he designed the wallpaper books that included not just the wall, but the trim, so that the catalog became a kind of machine through which you could turn your interior into a core painting almost mechanically. It was a failure. It did not, nobody bought it, uh, kind of a bad. 
but it was Le Corbusier, so you do it again. Um, you know, m multiple editions of failed uh, wallpaper, and the relationship between this wallpaper and, let's say, the status of art maybe accidentally gets confirmed uh, by Sherry Levine, who finally, in fact, uh, turns it into art. So this is, this is Venturi's wallpaper. He has of all kinds of legitimate reasons to imagine that his wallpaper is going to be a way to produce this uh, uh, building, and legitimate reasons to think of himself like Andy Warhol and like Le Corbusier as painters, and therefore as somebody who's really interested in color. So these letters go back and forth with a kind of crazy minute interest in the value of this color, the hue of that color. I want it to be a little bit more this color. Uh, these letters going, they're sending little pieces of wallpaper back and forth. I mean, my, this is 1978. There's, you know, think about the technology and the communication system required to get blue from here to there. Blue is a problem. What the hell is blue? What blue? You have to actually send the blue. And the fact, so An Andy Warhol, of course, has the factory in his studio. Venturi does not have the factory in his studio. The factory's over here, is over there. Blue is going all over the place and becoming increasingly a problem rather uh, than a solution. So more chips, more things, back and forth, more problems. Then the, then the manufacturers, who's going to make the blue, can da -da 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 -da, on and on. And of course, we have to do more research on signs because signs are where the color. Uh, it goes on and on and on until in 1979, um, the answer is no can't do those colors, no. And that letter, it's not just no once. This is all from the archive in the, in the Venturi archive. That letter gets copied in the Venturi office. That no is circulating around until finally somehow it makes its way to Bob's desk, where a new color, red, the editorial pencil, the pencil of urgency, says shit. Like, that's an everyday problem, right? Shit. Quoi faire? Very highfalutin. He's caught in this conflict that he thinks he's Corb. And actually, he's just got somebody who was just told no. So then what happens in the face of no? In the face of no, this new diabolical entity called Pantone enters the world. Um, Pantone having been invented very relatively recently to this moment, quite close to the Venturi office, and Pantone becomes the language of description. Pantone being a print technology, a photographic reproduction technology, and all colors in the world now have to start matching Pantone. And Pantone relieves the problem of sending little bits and pieces of color around because all you have to do is send the chip. So when you're an architect and your language of description is being taken over by Pantone, what the hell happens to your drawing? Like what do you, what, what do you need a pencil? Like what would you do with the drawing? And you start having these drawings where representational systems say on the one hand are beginning to fade into a kind of proto-digital digital numerical logic on the other, where the color values are being replaced by numbers and chips. And finally, you don't even really need the drawing at all anymore. All you need is the chips and the numbers. So architectural drawing is being displaced by a new, uh, a new system, a new numerical dis uh, system, a system that actually tells you what colors you can use and maybe uh, sets in motion a kind of debate between, uh, or conflict or friction, if you will, between the image of the architect as somebody like Korb, who was the source of all colors in the world, to the image of the architect who can really only say shit. Um, what am I going to do? And so part of what he does is produce these, uh, these crazy things. And you see the legacy of the trips to the library and the yellow tracing paper. You see the Pantone chips are there. You still see now very, very small, a little representation of the facade of the building, a crazy uh, mixed, uh, mixed genre, if you, uh, if you will. 
So what happens by, what's been happening, let's say, here, um, were a series of efforts to maintain authorial control over design, a series of efforts that generates uh, negotiations, miscommunications, technology transfers, and so forth, all of which leave their traces not in the museum and the drawings that traditionally entered it, but in what I would call a new locus of architectural authorship, the extraordinary normal. Instead of prosaic transfers of information or self-consciously significant representations, which is to say the document and the drawing, what you have instead in the extraordinary normal is a drama of the friction between these two different models. So if you look at this page, this friction is, uh, you know, I love the fact that it's legal paper, but the legal paper is on its side. The Pantone chips are there, but they're kind of, uh, like aggressively taped over, it's very authorial, up in the right, do this, don't do that, lines and vectors and so forth, an endless, an endless uh, set of instructions, let's say, that come together in a kind of new paradigm of architectural representation. Now, one of the things that happened in this period was uh, like this. Um, part of what you see here is a debate about what architecture is and who controls it. And if you think back to some of the standard tropes of the period of the 60s and 70s, there, there is literally again and again a staging of this a debate about what counts as architecture and what does not count as architecture. So the, you know, there's, there's the shed and then there's the duck. And there's John Portman, not an architect according to Peter Eisenman, but a professional and a developer. And Peter Eisenman like gladiators on either side of the table. Or Rosalind Krauss, architecture and not architecture. A, a kind of endless uh, agony uh, uh, about what architecture was and who would control it. A kind of incipient anxiety that architecture could easily get sucked back into the landscape, that it could just disappear in a proliferation, uh, in a proliferation of signs. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know whether this photographer, David Graham, who came, this looks staged, he came across this sort of by accident one day, um, and it's really not clear uh, whether he's photographing the building or the painting on the building or where you're supposed to direct your attention, uh, but it is a universe in which they start to merge. Uh, this universe is perceived as hostile uh, by architects. So there he is with his wallpaper thinking he's making Andy Warhol. Um, and it turns out that he's making somebody's old shower curtain. Um, this goes back to the office. And they are super concerned um, you know, about, about the, uh, the conservative area that they're dealing with. So there is pop, and then there is the, actually the population who doesn't like pop. Um, and it produces, again, the red pencil, uh, urgent. The whole office has to deal with this and trying to find uh, uh, an audience. Um, uh, architecture and its audience of this period um, was really, uh, um, you know, enormously uh, uh, complex. If you think about the Pantone as a kind of control mechanism uh, over uh, over design, if you will, Pantone that became widely distributed, everybody could pick those uh, colors. You start having um, what's been fantastically referred to as the coronation of the amateur, um, which is to say everybody thinks that they're an architect. Anybody who can pick a color in Pantone chip or pick paint out of uh, the Corb catalog becomes a kind of architect, if you will. Um, this is an amazing drawing sent to uh, Michael Graves by one of his uh, clients. Um, so the origin of the Claghorn House is here. It's pretty detailed. I mean, I don't know how you guys as architects would feel uh, about getting this as a set of instructions from your client. I mean, she's pretty emboldened, right? I, I, she, she pretty much thinks she's the architect uh, here. Um, this, and maybe she is, right? I don't know. Uh, look at Charles Moore, one of his first houses, billing for half an hour. Like, what's the value? What is the, you know, this is a, a huge crisis of value in this time. I, I still haven't decided whether I think this drawing, this letter, I think of it as a drawing, whether he's the cheapest bastard I ever heard of, you know, that you would bill for 15 bucks, or broke as hell, 
and underpaid and undervalued and for whom that 15 bucks was totally worth the time of sending a letter. So who were architects talking to? Like they were, to, they were talking to factories and they had to talk to them in a different way. They had to use Pantone, they couldn't use this color. They had to speak in, in vernacular shit. They had to be speak in French because that was the language of high art. Like mass, like a communication, like clusterfuck if you'll pardon my French. And they feel really bad about it. They feel really bad about the growing menace of design review. All those people with a goddamn opinion. That's really the problem, right? Stifling creativity and originality. Mr. Ordinary. Mr. Ordinary believes in pop culture, believes in every man, and every man all of a sudden is every woman with a pencil and an opinion. And it's a problem. So, what do you do? How do you, how do you deal with this? Who's in control of architecture and design? How far do you have to go to escape these mechanisms of control? What are the systems that you need to produce to produce alternative forms of control? So Sea Ranch is another kind of epicenter, if you will, of the history of uh, postmodernism where one can begin to uh, think about this. So um, the story of Sea Ranch begins, uh, you know, with this incredible coastline and there should be a park and becomes, uh, it becomes a development. Uh, it becomes a development. The first person on the scene is not the architect. This would be another story. The architect is the latecomer. The architect is the consultant. He's the consultant to the landscape architect. The landscape architect is organizing, organizing uh, the terrain, naturalizing uh, this environment um, with the purpose of making it into a place like this. This is one of uh, Anna Halperin's dance performances, but really the original impulse of Sea Ranch would be that it would be a place where everybody could go and return to nature and in returning to nature find their individual God-given right to self-expression and determination by creativity. This is the era of the creative everyone. So how do you design for the creative everyone? This is a very tricky problem. So mm, you begin with an ad campaign, just the way the Venturi project began with an ad campaign. The first thing that goes up is the sign. There is no house led, there's nothing there yet, just the sign. There will be a development here. And then of course you need a selling plan. So the sign becomes a whole strategy for getting people to come and you build a model house and then you have them eat a picnic and the picnic is in a bag that is the sign. So you're actually consuming the place as if, you know, like subliminal advertising, consume a sea ranch so that you'll come. Okay. So then they're, 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 they're you know, so this, the design of this free person dancing, what are they going to dance on? They need a deck. They need a stage. They need a platform. All those goddamn trees. Got to get rid of the trees or there's no place to dance. Got to get rid of the trees in your nature thing. So here are some of the early drawings that show the deforestation of the landscape that is required to produce the natural landscape in which natural self-expression will take place. And there's a thing about trees. They have a way of wanting to come back. They, co they, they, they come back. So you have to spray it with two, four, 5T, which very shortly thereafter is called Agent Orange. Okay, so you make a, the Agent Orange the place, there's your stage. And then you have to turn the stage into a theater. So we know from Serlio, we have categories of theater. We have tragedy, we have comedy, and we have pastoral. Pastoral it is, because this is a nature thing. Pastoral takes its sign from pastoral buildings like barns and so forth. So you do things with wooden slats and so forth that look like barns. So now you have your flat 
terrain and you have your theater, your stage set, your, your, and then of course, who's gonna come? You have to turn to your uh, audience and turning to an audience means turning to the market. And this is a moment in which market research became an essential design uh, protocol. Every architect uh, was involved in market uh, research. Market research was the way you branded, you know, think of Sea Ranch as the beginning of theme architecture, but there it is, 1963, theme. So what is the theme of Sea Ranch gonna be? Discovery, prestige, not the word that would have come to my mind, actually, uh, et cetera. So lots of, so the first year of design is the design of the description of the vocabulary of the theme. Then it goes to market research, group interviews, who's going to come and, and who can they sell this to and what is, how do you make, how do you produce the person who wants to go and dance on the beach, right? Well, so that person needs to have $30,000, no disabilities, and they need to not want to live in something that appears to be uh, suburbia. So now we have a kind of subject that is going to come in order to now, okay. So this, you know, you need more and more detail. That's not enough, $30,000. There could be a lot of people. There are not that many people. So then all of those people to coming to lunch, you make them write down their comments. And then the comments are amazing, unique. For those of you who don't know how to spell, it's not spelled right. Awful, too windy, bitchin'. And are you serious? I, I don't, this is gonna, that one is gonna come back. But what's amazing, what's amazing about this piece of paper is not that people wrote that. You could imagine people wrote it. What's amazing is that the architects transcribed it and kept it, like it's they found their market, the market wasn't really what they wanted, and then they were kind of stuck with this market, like what, what do you do for that? How do you design for that? Well, uh, so this is how you do it. You have your pretty picture of the landscape, and then you set up rules. Rules, rules, and rules, not just like DDT, but restrict, you can do this plant and this plant, and you can only design in a certain way. So the next phase of paperwork is obsessed with establishing rules, and in fact, C Ranch is really just a set of rules. That's all it is. Standard form, no Cape Cod houses, ranch types, etc. Then even these guys, they start legislating color. How are we going to make it look like a barn? What is a natural color, they say. The discussions about color are totally fascinating. They say only, only local natural color. Uh, then somebody pipes up, the flowers get pretty hot in their colors. That's a problem. So they go back and forth and, and you know, okay, you, you got to love this. It ends up the colors gray, brown, gray, brown. That's nature. So when you turn nature into a rule, that's what happens, right? Gray and ground. It's like when you turn nature into a theater, you need to have Agent Orange. That's how it works. Okay, but that's not even enough because so you get the colors, but you uh, we really could do a lot of things with colors. You got to go farther. You've got to actually start regulating feelings, not just colors. So we have to make certain that the buyers don't just have $30,000 and no physical uh, deformities, but they need to have a feeling about what it is that they're gonna do. I don't know how you know that, honestly, but apparently they do. And not only do the owners have to have feelings, but architects have to have them too. And the way you teach architects how to have the right feelings is that you give them a design protocol and design begins, you go with your sensory awareness. I hope there's nobody here who actually teaches this in studio because I'm not really making fun of you, um, but, but if you do, I would ask you to hesitate. 
Um, you go, you explore, you have your sensory this and that, and then you turn it into a narrative, and then the narrative becomes the authentic, and now you're in the right feeling state. You've engineered the right feeling state of the architect to match the right feeling state of the owner so that everybody is really happy in a brown building. So then by the time you get here, you are in your moment where you can start imagining that you're in an Anna Halperin dance being free and doodly do. You're actually so entrenched in a regulated environment uh, that you can't even see it. So this regulation of the free individual leads, even to the architects themselves, it's not like they're not aware of this, it leads uh, on the one hand to this totally encompassing design manual system that is now like this fat, you know, that gets added to every year. Somebody figures out how to sneak in yellow green and the law comes down and, you know, then rules have to be abandoned. But Charles Moore, who was one of the architects of the first condo, um, seemed to sense from the beginning that all this regulation was going to need a kind of escape pod. And he uh, uh, had elaborate fantasies of escape. His ideal house was a house on wheels. Um, a house on wheels, by the way, that was inside, nestled inside the log cabin that looks like the sea ranch cabin. Somehow he wanted a key that he could turn on and just get the hell out of all of those uh, design uh, regulations. A temporary dwelling, a kind of freedom where you can just uh, move on. That freedom was the movable bed and the movable house. There was no architect who moved more frequently than Charles Moore. And in every place that he lived, he set up one of these crazy bed platforms, like as though it could just have wheels. And here it is in New Haven, and then it moves to Orinda, uh, California. There is the thing on the inside, and then it gets on wheels again. You notice that they're getting a little bit more exaggerated with every time as though just moving wasn't enough. Now the bedroom has to get kind of hysterical. It's going, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, as in now it's in uh, Texas. And this is his bed um, in, in Sea Ranch um, with the little shades that go up and down. And, 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 but it wasn't just, and here he is, designing his bed, designing his escape pod from the system of regulated creative uh, freedom. Um, and he wanted to give it to everybody. So in the condominium where there are nine units, every single one begins with a bed. Charles Moore's bed is weird. I find that very weird that his bed is inserted into every one of these units as though he's trying to push uh, people out, go. Um, and so then on the interior, this is his bed pod thing. Of course, this becomes the place where all of those rules don't apply. So for all of their crazy rules about color and no flashing, lights out at 10, by the way. You can't have any lights on that shine outside of your unit at 10, after 10 p.m. Um, the inside goes crazy, right? Totally hysterical, hyperbolic, extra color, extra, extra lights, extra stuffing, extra, extra. So all of these design regulations somehow produce the need for this, the escape from design. Right, design rules leads to more uh, design, design as escape. Um, and design as escape meant more signs. Um, these are, Barb, she did, this is Barbara Stalfetcher's uh, super graphic work. Um, they, she did the ones uh, inside Moore's condo, um, more and more signs, elaborate signs as the exterior becomes more and more regulated, the interior becomes the site of compensatory, let's say, hysteria, right? Over design, hyperbolic design on the interior. But then the architects are, you know, they're looking at the response to her design and realizing that people like her crazy design actually more than they like their regulated design. So then they start redrawing everything. This is the landscape at Sea Ranch, this is the later landscape at Sea Ranch, so that it looks like her hysterical design. 
So in the end, you actually don't know where you are, whether you're in the escape pod or in the system of rules. And they're all uh, uh, a kind of uh, um, uh, super typical subject, if you will. These crazy individual people, are you serious? Remember, this was the language of the color thing, the problem of are you serious? This is one of her uh, um, super graphics on the women's uh, bathroom. Uh, women, apparently, there's no male sign in the male bathroom. The women sign, they have to apparently be reminded that they're women. I don't know, I would think that in the bathroom you don't really need to be reminded that you're a woman, but there's a kind of exaggerated identity politics, a kind of super, a super type of person that is being designed uh, to manage all of this uh, design. So having to confront all of these people that are entering design, all of these women and landscape architects and sign painters and, and all of these people who think of themselves as able to design, as entering the design situation, uh, becomes a kind of problem, right? So the architect wants to exert authority over their own design, but now everybody is also uh, an architect and a designer. So to assert authority over your design turns out to constitute asserting design, uh, authority over another person. And this was a hugely articulated uh, problem in this period, um, one of which architects were very aware, uh, perhaps nobody more so than Peter Eisenman. Uh, because his solution was in his mind to get rid of people altogether. That's really just the solution, right? So you can have total authority if you're not dealing with anybody, any place, any anything. So house one, in his hypothetical drawings of house one, house one begins here, right? So it's really easy to become totally in control of a cube. I don't know. They don't fight back, I guess. And then you can do what you want with them. Like, you can cut them up, you can slice them up, you can, you can do all kinds of things to cubes, and the cubes just sit there and let you produce your, your, your they kind of demonstrate your authority uh, uh, over them. So again, if you start looking around in the parts of house one that didn't circulate the way Eisenman exactly wanted them to, you can see two set, two versions of House One, or two versions of uh, the origins and significance of House One, like, like these two. So there on the right is the sign, the sign and the sign of the architect, and Peter Eisenman is signed, and no matter which way you turn the paper, you know, you're still looking at the logic of Peter Eisenman. And then the one on the left is a little bit more problematic. It's a little bit harder to understand what's going on on this piece of paper. It has some drawings. Um, it has uh, running square feet of drawer space. It has note to get a topo map. It has, uh, it has all kinds of things that really shouldn't belong to the universe of the cube, and it has this person. And it has a person standing on what is clearly a second floor uh, balcony. Now, balconies are interesting places uh, because in, even in a hypothetical world, you can fall off a balcony. Um, which is to say, if you, you might believe in the computer environment where there is no gravity and there is no direction and there is no, no up and down and there is no physics, but if you fall from a second story balcony, you could kind of hurt yourself. So second story balconies become the site in the 1960s of a, of a continually revised series of legislations. So before, at least in New Jersey, before 1960, one of the students here will remember the exact year, there are no legislations about handrails um, on the interior of residential buildings. By the time Eisenman is doing this, there are regulations about handrails, like you can't actually kill people in your houses. I suppose this would be like a minimum standard, right? No, no, no death. So um, if you start looking at the drawings, there is a super ambivalence about handrails. If you, the one on the right, no handrails drawn. 
the one on the left, you have to look really, 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 really hard. But there are handrails drawn in there. And then if you're, if you're me, you call Peter Eisenman and you say, what about the handrails in House One? And he goes, ah, there are no handrails in House One. So that led me thinking. So we go back and we look at the other houses. No handrails, not really. Right? So he figures out by the second house how to hide the handrail, how not to have a handrail, to have a parapet, because a parapet can be made to behave in the logic of the cube. It's part of the wall. Right? So then look at parapets. That's the thing. That's the solution. Who would have thought? Hmm. But there are handrails. <laughs> and these are them. So then you go, okay, Peter, there are handrails. Oh, yeah, I guess there were handrails. You know, Corb handrails. So then you go look at Corb. Okay, tubular steel, Corb handrails. Uh, Corb handrails. Michael Graves, more or less same year, half a mile away. Probably the same contractor, as a matter of fact. Handrails. These are Corbusian handrails. Evenly spaced. Key, evenly spaced handrails not evenly spaced. These are messed up handrails. Yeah, over the years, the hand spacing, you, you know, the, the cracks of the handrail get smaller and smaller, so you can, you know, okay. So then you start looking even more carefully at the handrails. Not only, they're, not only are they there, not only are they not evenly spaced, they're painted. And they're elaborately painted, not just one color, but two colors. And not the easy way. Look at that, the vertical beam. No paint across the, no paint. In some of the drawings, he is worried about handrails and knows that he will get in trouble if he doesn't have a handrail and that guy falls off and dies. But because he has to have a handrail, he makes it an amazing handrail. And the handrail, the spacing of the handrail, is the space of the golden section. They are golden section handrails. Never thought such words would come out of my mouth. And the golden section then becomes the logic through which the cube is divided. So the non-existent, odious handrail actually is the site for the logic of the production of the geometry. And then when you look more at the handrail, you see that the handrail is doing an enormous amount of work in the design, the painting of it. Look at that gray bar. I mean, is, it, is this obvious? I get very jazzed about this kind of thing. Because really, I love design. This is what I love about it. I mean, look at that. He paints it right here. That's the handrail. So you have this big wall that comes down. The handrail is holding up the fucking house. It's sitting on the handrail. <laughs> look like a line. So the handrail is the thing that it enables him to imagine, first of all, that there is no handrail, and secondly, that the house is actually a drawing. Right? Turns it into a sign. This is what he's imagining. And then, of course, you have to have some fun and start going through the thing at the handrail and how far would he go and does he outwit the handrail. So if you look in the Frank house, this is the most um, movemented. Look, so there's no handrail. There's glass. It's, I don't know. Parapet think maybe is better than glass. I don't, I don't know. But this, nope, glass is out. Handrail is in. OK, then, then there's this one. Uh, OK. Now, oh, I left out one. Bummer, you can't see it. So you know that, the, oh no, you can sort of see it here. The, the, this, the way he solves really the problem of the handrail, the stair and the handrail, is the upside down stair. That one has no handrail because it's upside down and can't actually kill anybody. And maybe it was out of frustration that he had not quite figured out how to actually construct the death trap that he produces this bed that turns out to be the death trap, which then leads them to remake the bed so that their child can't fall through the crack. Um, just because it's not really a story of handrails, but a story of the integration of regulation and a questioning of who's in control of what, and those very regulations 
all you architects, you always complain about handrails. You hate handrails. You always say that you're gonna get the certificate of occupancy guy in and then you're gonna take out the goddamn handrails because you don't like them. Okay, but the handrail actually did some very heavy lifting here and it wasn't just the handrail, it was the interaction with all of these guys. So this is another one. This is Mrs. Barinholtz. She wanted one thing in her house. She had one program request. She wanted a fireplace. So I called Peter Eisenman. Tell me about the fireplace. There is no fireplace in the house, he says. Well, actually, yeah, there's a, and then he starts calling the guys who he built the house with to confirm that there was no fireplace to confirm, in fact, that he had had a battle with this woman about the fireplace and to confirm that he had won the battle by not giving her a fireplace and by giving her instead what appeared to be a dummy fireplace. So she got her sign of a fireplace and he got his autonomy, except a fireplace there was. And again, his solution to the fireplace was to never put a fireplace back in the house. Again, house one has a fireplace, house one has handrails. The battles at that moment entrain him to produce the other houses in a different way. But not before he left just a little maybe accident in the fireplace. Peter, a voice from outside with a red pencil an internal dialogue about architecture takes place in the fireplace. Historically, the very heart of architecture, the hearth. It's like he leaves inadvertently a little bomb. Peter, get the stare out of the fireplace. She lights that fire, the house is going up in smoke. Right? So right at the center where security should take place, there is inadvertently, I would say, an expression, an inadvertent expression of this conflict between who's in control and who's uh, not. So speaking of explosions, uh, Charles Jenks said postmodernity began with an explosion like this one. He famously said that the explosion of pruitt Igo was what ended modernism and began postmodernism. So postmodernism begins with death in an explosion. But only tragedies have clear beginnings and endings. The postmodern operates instead through melodrama and signals not the death of the author, but its continual reappearance in the gaps left by the very efforts to kill it. I don't dig graves. Who would have thought that this building is now on the National Register of Historic Places? We all kind of feel ambivalent, Hernan. <laughs> so the exhibition in the other room that will, I hope that you'll join me with uh, in a moment is an archive in support of a history of these gaps where friction between architects seeking control over design and the use of design to control the personhood of others become visible. In the gallery, there are to be seen the expected postmodern tropes of color and representation, drawing and history, but close attention also reveals the new drama of designing and fabricating a cast of characters and cadences like the super typical, the extraordinary normal, and the inadvertently expressive. So while fragments salvaged from here and there testify to the loss and deflation of architectural autonomy and authority, they also track ingenuity as it finds crazy new places uh, in which to live. So this is postmodernism today, House One. Thank you. Thank you.